Okay. All right. Thank you for joining me today. I very keen to be here in Milano um, talking about Power Platform Code Components today. As I see it as one approach to the Fusion development team inside Microsoft Universe or the Power Platform. So, <coughs> and first things first, not working, but I'm happy to jump over here, just jump to the next slide. Of course, you will see this slide a lot today, and it is an important slide because the sponsors of today's events uh, make it possible that we are here, that I'm talking to you, of course, and whenever you have time between sessions, visit them, uh, check them out, check them out what they can do for you, for your daily business, for example, uh, and make sure that we are able to participate in the such events next year as well. Also, a big shout out, not only to the sponsors, but to the organizers of such a cool event. I, to be honest, it's a real cool event. The venue is great. So, um, also a big shout out to the organizers. Who is talking to you today? My name is Maximilian Müller. Uh, <laughs> learned that Müller is a name you are uh, also familiar here in Italy some, sometimes. Um, I work in, I come from Austria, of course. Um, I work in Graz. It's a little down south of Austria. And I work for a company called Solvion. Um, I work as a solution architect um, at Solvion. If you are, um, and my customers usually um, companies where I try to create solutions to make their, to make their use cases secure, um, viable, and yeah, productive, um, so to speak, um, mostly with Microsoft 365 technologies and, of course, with a focus on the Power Platform. I did do this since eight, nine years almost. I started with the on-premise technologies, of course, SharePoint 2010, 2013, and all the low-code tools that came with it. So you probably know if you are familiar with on-premise technology, SharePoint Designer, InfoBuff, um, Workflow Engine. And since we moved to the cloud, mostly, and our customers moved to the cloud, I, of course, moved to the Power Platform. But why I choose the topic today is because I'm believing in the Power Platform and I'm coming from a company who is mostly into professional development, so to speak. So pro code, uh, sometimes you call it. And I try to come up with a story and when I'm thinking of Italian, I'm always thinking of the movies of my childhood. So I'm coming up with this guy. <laughs> so. Uh, but Spencer is in my, today he is our IT professional. He's a tough guy. He knows a lot of stuff. He also was an Olympic uh, swimmer. That's true. I hope so. He's, he's one of my childhood heroes. Whenever I turned on TV on Saturdays in Austria, you had some movies on there. So, but he usually, or most, uh, or in his most movies, he's not only the only guy who works against the bad guys. So with the Power Platform and with the low-code approach, not only IT professionals have to create solutions, also we have other guys. So we have citizen makers or citizen developers or business makers, whatever you call it. And in our case, it's... Um, they're in sale. So, but they usually, if you know the movies, and I guess you all are familiar with them, they are not usually working together that smoothly. And our Fusion team, or our Power Platform Fusion team, tries to make it possible for professional um, developers and citizen developers 
to coexist, to work together as a team, as a fusion team. How do we approach that? First, of course, I have a few slides for the Power Platform, so to introduce you into the Power Platform if you're not familiar. I promise to you, I keep it short, <laughs> but I need it to build up to bring you to the component framework. i show you then some examples and some uh, categories. Uh, you can put the uh, code components in there. And then we will jump into the nice stuff, in my opinion. We jump into a demo, how to create your own code component, and how you can start with code components. But yeah, start on. Um, in our case, I usually um, when we talk about the Power Platform, I show this slide. I like it because it says Microsoft looks at low code differently. It's true some, in some cases, uh, but you have the different services inside of the Power Platform. So you have Power Automate, you have Power BI for your data visualization or process automation. You have now Cobalt Studio to create your own co-pilots, your custom co-pilots, to extend your co-pilots. But today we will focus on the Power Apps um, and Power Apps portals. Because code components are part of Power Apps. And apps, of course, that's the interfaces you can provide for your users if you want your users to interact with your data. So, um, as it is low code, um, there is something, usually it's meant for people who are not IT professionals, who are not um, from IT department, who are not used to patterns we use in IT. So Microsoft came up, because that can be problematic in most cases, so Microsoft came up with um, some development patterns they introduced into the Power Platform. You find a lot of development patterns inside of the Power Platform. I just put some examples on that slide. For example, application lifecycle management. You have the center of excellence, for example. If you want to monitor or govern your uh, governance inside of your my, uh, Power Platform tenant, you have, of course, some mobile app development patterns there that make it easier to create real mobile app first apps and so on, process automation um, and so on. But those patterns are also targeted towards our citizen developers. Our citizen developers are the, yeah, that's the target group of those patterns, and they should use it to make it more secure, to make it more easy for them to use the Power Platform. But also approach to, um, to work with citizen developer is the fusion development um, topic or phrase, so to speak. Microsoft brings it a lot in the last few years, and it's, it, it's a cool uh, concept. The concept is basically you have different roles inside of your uh, tenant. You have the citizen developers, you have the professional developers, ID professionals, put them together here. And if you join as a team, you can scale. So you can do more, more efficient um, with the tools that provided by Microsoft. So you see, but in this case, we want to make it a little bit more easy to understand what fusion development is. So I provided, uh, I prepared this slide here. So fusion development, in my opinion, is something where you have different domains. You have the first domain, the uh, basic domain of control and providing um, resources inside of the Power Platform. This is usually IT professional stuff. It's IT administrators who work with their dedicated tools. 
some cases you already have the center of excellence installed, you have the Power Platform Admin Center, um, Azure, and so on. They provide, for example, solutions, environments, whatsoever. So what's a resource inside of your Power Platform tenant, they usually can provide. Then you have the section of create. This is where all the magic happens, in my opinion. Because I want usually work with the people who create stuff, who create exciting solutions um, to make it happen for them and to give them ideas as a solution architect. In this case, we have two different roles here in our Fusion development team. We have the professional developers with their dedicated tool set, and we have the citizen developers also with their dedicated tool set. So the citizen developers work with PowerFX, drag and drop inside of the Power Automate Maker portal, and so on. But we don't do this just for us, for us in ID or us in the business. We do this for our end users. We do this for the users who are um, consuming our apps, running our processes, or consuming the data we provide via Power BI and so on. And today's session is focused on one particular person. It's focused on the professional developers. Why? The reason is, I work as a solution architect in a company um, heavily invested into professional code development and so on. When I'm coming around with a Power Platform project and asks them, hey, please create an app inside of the Maker portal, they begin to laugh, usually. So I had to find a way to include them into our development patterns or into our solutions for the customers. And one way is to create them or let them create code components. So provide them, uh, let them provide stuff we need in our projects, so to speak. Um, and for that, a basic um, to understand code components is the component framework. So think of the component framework as something as the framework, and one part in it is code components. What is the code component, uh, the component framework, sorry? The component framework is basically the possibility inside of the Power Platform Power Apps Maker portal to create components that are tailored to your needs. Sometimes you're not able to create it that easily inside of the Maker portal, or if you have components that will be reuse, reused in different apps over different tenants or different environments, you also can create component framework. So a good idea to have as a component in companies, or what I start with companies when they start with a component framework, I usually start with a navigation. So you think every app usually needs a, uh, an, a navigation. Of course, it could be a single screen, but most apps are more than one screen. So if you create a navigation component, you can um, create it that way that the style of your company uh, needed to be. So for example, um, it's always on the top, it always looks the same, it's always in blue, whatever. And the nice thing about component framework is I can export this component and then provide it to each app. And each maker, each app developer can use this component the correct way with all the properties I provide. And you make sure that each time a user opens a power app inside of your tenant, you have the same navigation, the same style, the same way it, it behaves, and so on. And code components uh, also um, have the same benefits as the co component framework. So as I said, it's 
with this as a, you can export them as a solution as well. With this, you are already application lifecycle management ready. It's integratable into solutions, code components. There is still one bug um, if you're interested, but they should be <laughs> solution integratable. And you can fiddle around with the Power Platform CLI, the command line interface, to interact with them, to manage them, and um, yeah, to basically provide them into different environments if necessary. And one cool feature that comes with code components is that they build upon, or you can use, React and Fluent UI libraries. So if you are familiar with the greatest kit, for example, in the Power Platform, that builds a lot of the React and Fluent libraries that are used there. And if you are working in other solutions inside of your um, company already with React and Fluent libraries, that's a good start, that's a good starting point, that knowledge you can use also in code components. And code components are usually provided into all kinds of Power Apps. I still have the Power Pages there, I know that they um, uh, excluded it from the Power Apps. Um, um, yeah, uh, domain, but you already, you can use code components in model driven apps, power pages, and of course, canvas apps. So all kind of apps are ready for components. So this brings me to a little, at, um, yeah, a, a, a slide from Microsoft I, I stole. So. Our development team here, or our Fusion development team here, you see code first developer on the left side with their dedicated tool set, and you have the citizen developers on their side with their dedicated tool set. And what the code first, or professional developer, or whatever you want to call it, somebody who writes code, do in the opinion of Microsoft is providing services, Azure services, Microsoft Azure, Logic Apps, and so on, APIs, which can be consumed in the Power Platform via Custom Connector and via the citizen developers. That's cool, I know, but where are the code components? The code components, in my opinion, is another pillar of that. So. Code-first developers don't have to stop at providing services. They can write little applications, little apps on their own and provide them in their, uh, to their makers inside of the Power Platform. How does that look like? So let's take a look at that a little bit closer. I categorized it um, a little bit. Yep. The first thing that comes into my mind usually when I talk about code components are visualizations. So if you have special visualization that um, something you need because your data is built upon it, you can do it via code components. For example, you have a certain progress bar style that you are want to use and you are, your users are used to use inside of your Power Apps or not Power Apps, uh, inside of your applications. You can build it as a code component. Or, for example, you have a risk matrix. That's usually two integer values on two, um, two parameters. So what you can do with code components is you can build it as a, um, as a nice graphic, put the um, values in there, let the users interact with it, and save the values as you need it to be in be behind in your data source. Other way of using code components is service integration. You probably think if you look at that screen, damn it, that are services I can use with out-of-the-box connectors. Correct. 
Um, most of them. <laughs> but out-of-the-box connectors have limits. And with code components, you are able to sometimes uh, overcome those limits if they are not limits of the services itself, of course. Also, in some cases, you don't want to give the user the full access to all SQL data or whatever. What you can do with the service integration is you can also manipulate the data before the user consumes it in the Power Platform. So that's also a nice way to make sure the data is handled correctly. And of course, I already explained it, we are working with Fluent UI um, libraries and React libraries. Component transformation is also a category. So whenever you have a drop down, you have a map or something like that, you can um, build it as a code component and make it look like anything else you're already using inside of the Microsoft 365 universe. So that's a nice way to have, for example, the people um, visualization or the track and drop uh, file uh, uploader and so on. A different topic you will not see that often uh, from others is JavaScript implementation. Who is familiar with, who is already familiar with um, model driven apps says, okay, yeah, we can't do that since a long time. That's true. But with Canvas apps, you never had the possibility before code components came around. So with code components, you can create JavaScript code implementations that are executed inside of your Canvas app, which is pretty cool, in my opinion. Because if you ever looked into the inspect um, screen of your browser, when you open a Power App, you will see it's nothing else than a Tom tree. And our example and our um, yeah, my demo today is um, I will provide you with a demo how to execute a JavaScript code um, that communicates with Microsoft Clarity. If you're not familiar with Microsoft Clarity, it's a typical tracking tool um, free from Microsoft where you can track sessions really, um, really nicely and really good. Um, and I will show you how to create so such a component today, because it's really easy. Okay. Um, but before we jump into the demo, I just provide you with the necessary tool set. What do we need if we want to create code components? In our case, um, of course, we have usually IT professionals, de professional developers, who already have knowledge in TypeScript, HTML, and CSS. So that's usually a basic knowledge around code um, savvy guys, or um, yeah or is something they can learn quite easily if they come from uh, other code languages. On the other side, okay, we are writing code. We, of course, need a code editor. In my opinion, and if you ask me about a recommendation, I would recommend you Visual Studio Code because there are a lot of cool plugins for our code components and the Power Platform. So um, knock yourself out with it if you have the chance. But basically installed on that machine that you need to, or you using for developing code components, there should be installed Node JavaScript with NBM, so the uh, Node Package Manager, MS Build or .NET um, SDK for the build process. And to handle our components, if you Thinking back a few slides, of course, I need to install also the Power Platform command line interface. Yeah, and that's a good starting point, the command line interface. So I just jump into my terminal here, 
And I have a cheat sheet, to be honest. So if you don't mind me typing everything in there. So I jump into a prepared uh, directory here. Um, and I put in my first real command line interface command and execute it. I will talk about it a little in a few seconds. Just want to install the dependencies first. Give me a second. So now our dependencies are running. We can take a closer look at our part here. I just highlighted it to make it a little bit easier for you. So what you see here is PAC. So that's the namespace of the center uh, of the Power Platform CLI. And the specific namespace is PCF, so Power Platform Component Framework. Um, I initialize a new component, in this case with a namespace um, call up days Italy, name call up days Italy, and with a template. There are currently two templates available. There is the template field and data set. And the field template is a little bit easier to understand, so I choose that for my demo today. But you can do that demo as well with the data set. Doesn't make that much dif difference. So, and if that, yeah, it executed quite nicely. I open my folder in Visual Studio Code and drag that along here. And what the CLI da da did is downloading the necessary files. So you see on the left here are quite a lot of files, but two very important files. So we have that control manifest input XML and the index TypeScript file. In I will just show you something. I'm just removing all this demo stuff here um, because we don't need it, and it's mostly comments anyway. So what I do is I replace it with a little part I already prepared, and we'll talk about it. So the manifest is usually your metadata and all the necessary uh, parameters provided for your code component. In our case, you see we have a property. In because Microsoft Clarity, you can create projects there, and each project have the project ID. I can provide this project ID via property. So in this case, you see your Clarity project ID, uh, display name, how it should be seen by the user, uh, a description, and so on. And on, on top of that, we have the control where you see the version, the constructor, and so on, uh, the name again. You can change it here, of course. And what we also have here is we have the external service usage. In our case, it is enabled not enabled. Because we're just communicating towards Microsoft Clarity. We are not consuming any data. If I would consume data from a service, I would have to enable it and provide the correct um, namespace here for that. Also, what you have here is, of course, the resources of your code component. It's, in our case, just one file, the TypeScript file. and um, yeah, but if you had, for example, icons, images, uh, CSS files, whatsoever, you would put it in here, um, reference it here, save it somewhere um, in, in the code component or in the folder, and um, yeah, it would be the, the correct way to put it. That's basically our manifest. It's Pretty easy. It's nothing compli uh, complicated, in my opinion. Um, let's jump into the TypeScript. So that's where usually the real magic happens. Our TypeScript is a little bit more complicated, I, I, uh, I'm afraid of. 
Um, usually, um, I'm, when I talk about it, I just provide some information about the most important functions. In this case, we have the init function. Um, as it the name says, it starts when the initialization of your code component happens. So wherever you put that in your app, when it loads, this will fire. So that's the place where we want to put our uh, code, of course. But there are more functions. There's the update view function you see here. Down. The update view is fired always or whenever um, something happens in your app or somebody interacts with your app somehow. So the best example is you have a button in there, user clicks the button, this function will be fired. Get outputs is the next function. Um, this is usually if you are with working with data, working with external data services, whenever you have an update for the data uh, and the data will be um, sent live to your code component or whatsoever, here is the place to put your logic in there. So that would be the get outputs um, component. And of course, because it is well formed, we have a destroy function. That is something a lot of developers, in my opinion, uh, overlook. But um, whenever you leaving the screen with your code component, you should use the destroy function to make uh, to to give back the, the storage of your of your RAM and um, yeah um, yeah basically um, clean up the control. Um, whenever the user leaves um, a screen with the uh, with this code component, but as I said, we just need to have a little little thing to add here. I add here our HTML HTML diff element. So I just initialize it here, and in our init function, I put some code here. I will go through it, but you will see it's not that complicated. What I do in this code is basically I ask where is the header, the first header of our HTML tree. Then I create a script tag. In the script tag, I create a JavaScript function. This is the same function as you have um, if, if you create a Microsoft Clarity code or a ID, a project, so um, you get that code. So that's the function. I just put it into my script uh, tag here, and then I have my insert before, uh, so I make sure that my script um, is inserted before the first element of our header. And we have a little text diff here, so make sure that our users are aware that they been, have been tracked in our apps. That is usually a very important thing. You want them to make sure that they are aware that they are tracked, not to run into any complaints afterwards. And after that, just here, just wrap up everything, create our little diff, and then uh, pen the child, and that's it. So when I do that, save that, and jump into my terminal here, you will see you can run two commands. First command is I run npm run build. It should build if we've done everything correctly. It looks good. Succeeded, so that's fine. And now I can start NBM start watch, which is a cool way because code components or the component framework comes with a test environment. So you don't have to create your code components first and then upload it and 
try it and make sure you're not um, um, on the correct way and then have to redo it and stuff like that. But with this, you're able to test your components. And on the right side here, you see already we have our property we um, initialized in our um, um, manifest and so on. And you see the next that is also here. Um, we put in the diff. And if we jump to inspect and see if it already communicates to Microsoft Clarity, there it is. It's collect. Um, so that's where our code component sends the data to the Microsoft Clarity service, to the IT, uh, to the project ID I, I put in there, and it already working and sending data, the session here, to Microsoft Clarity. Of course, you need to do that as well inside of your environment. So I jump into my environment here. So what you see here is I have the solution. The first one here is the call updates Italy solution. I uploaded it yesterday because I'm, uh, on a, yeah, I just wanted to provide uh, a, a demo if if something goes wrong. But yeah, um, what I would do now in the in the terminal is I would build it. That's just a very boring two-liner in in the code um, to build it and you. I provide you also with some links to a uh, blog post where you can uh, do everything according at, as it should be. In our case, we have a solution called this Italy solution. I uploaded it yesterday. And you will see there is one object in there, only one. When it loads, yeah. There is only one custom control that called call up days Italy, call up days Italy, because I had the same namespace as the same name. And um, that's it. Now you will probably think, OK, I would put that custom control into my correct solution, where I have my app and so on. It is unfortunately, um, still, to the, to, still to this day, it's unfortunately not possible to do that. If you create code components, you need them in their own solutions. It's uh, still something Microsoft needs to fix. But uh, anyhow, you can, of course, l use the solution layering of the Power Platform. So um, have this as a solution, and your app and your Power Automate flows and so on, another solution and build upon it. But if I jump into my app here, I have an app that is called Poker Room. It's just a demo app, it's a template app, uh, to be honest. And I have it open here. Um, ignore, please, the DLB policies um, error. I fiddled around yesterday with it, uh, tried to fix it before the session because I saw that it were an error message. But yeah, um, it's still there, unfortunately. But it doesn't matter. Um, what you knew want to do now, or what we want to do now, is we want to add our code components, of course, into my Canvas app. Uh, in this case, you see we have our tree view, we have our inputs or um, controls, whatever you want to know, uh, name it, um, and but we don't see our code component. What you have to do now is you have to click this here, um, get more components. Uh, Microsoft changed the position of that button here uh, three times in the last few years. So that's also, which is really interesting. And you will see we have here, if you import components, the canvas uh, components. So that's something created from the uh, component framework. And you have the code components. Because I have installed the creators kit, as you see a lot of them. But in our case, we won't just have this call up this Italy. See, there's the public uh, default publisher. And I say import. 
What I would now expect that it pops up on my on my app screen, but it doesn't. What it does, it's just here now in the insert. Um, now we have to add it again. So now you see everything put in nicely. You can put it somewhere that the user is able to read it. Yeah, it's still the B error, but doesn't matter in our case. So now you see also the property here. So that's the property we um, provided in the manifest. And if we start in the play mode, can check the inspect, jump to the network tab, wait a few seconds. That's not the correct one. Now there it is. So it also already communicates to Microsoft Clarity. So that's really nice way to have a tracking tool or a tracking option inside of the PowerPlot or Power Platform. You can use also this um, this solution or this code component inside of um, model-driven apps as well. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah, my little slide for the demo, but let's sum up, uh, sum, um, summarize everything. So what we did today, or what I um, what we saw today, is that Power Platform is not only meant for the business users and the makers and the citizen developers, but with code components and other approaches, it is also something you can use for IT professionals, and you can work together as a team um, in our fusion development team. Back to our heroes. So, Bud Spencer and Darren Sale is our fusion development team, so to speak. So we have, of course, the IT professionals who can provide code components, who can provide different solutions with code components, and we have the citizen developers who create the app in the basic and then um, put the code components in there as it should be. If you want to start on your own, I have a um, blog post about it, Code Component Clarity, where everything is nice in order, or you can click it and create it on your own. Also, all the dependencies you need to download first are linked in there. If you want to start with components as, um, um, on itself, knock yourself out with the Microsoft Learn uh, content. Also, um, the next link is for the overview of components and code components. And you saw all the different um, examples on my screens. They are mainly from the BCF gallery because um, the BCF gallery is a community tool where a lot of people upload their code components and you can download them and use them inside of your Power Platform environments. Please be aware, whenever you download anything from the BCF gallery, check the code first. Don't take it uh, blindly. Don't uh, take it as um, it's, it's a community thing. So whenever you have something there that you want to adapt, download it, check the code, adapt the code to your needs, and then put it into, your, uh, into use. But it's a good way to start with code components and component framework um, in the Power Platform. If you have further questions, I'm still here. Um, I think um, my session is almost over. But yeah, and please give me feedback if possible. I really appreciate it. You had me here in Milano. I really like that place. Um, and yeah, if you have anything to add or you want to um, get in touch with me as well after the session. Um, please get in touch over these channels here. Um, if you, I think the organizers will upload the slides as well tomorrow. So um, you can, of course, download the slides and uh, go through it again if you need to. And that's everything from my side. Grazie. Um, yeah, and have a great rest of the 
convention and of the day, you will learn a lot and I hope you connect a lot to other people. Thank you.